And Lord, I pray we do that today, Lord, that we are pouring out our praise, Lord. All, all that comes out of our lungs, our breath, everything they have within us, Lord, that we pour it out to you. Lord, that we always remember it is from you and through you that we even have this opportunity to come and worship you. Lord, I pray today that you speak to us, God. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place, Lord, to have your way. We are your servants. We are your children, Lord, and I pray that you speak to us. I pray today, that, Lord, that I'm nothing more than your microphone, Lord, that any thoughts, words, or actions, you don't want to be a part of this message, Lord, remove them. Because, Lord, ultimately it's not to come to hear anybody stand up here and speak. It's to hear from you. So, Lord, it has to be your word going out. So, God, be with us, Lord. Guide us in all that we do. Speak to us, Lord. We love you and we thank you. In your name we pray and the whole church says amen and amen. Well, happy Sunday, One Step Church. Yeah. Are we doing good? What? How's everybody enjoying back, being back at school? Nice. Yeah. Oh, so, so good. Yeah, even with a kid who's a senior, I don't have to take him to school anymore. I still got to get up early now just to get ahead of the traffic to get into work and all because I'd rather just, I'd rather be a little bit early than sit for an extra 30 minutes in traffic. So it's been amazing so far. We got a beautiful day out. You know, it's kind of, it's funny. We've been complaining about the heat and then typically in here it's not, it's not cold enough. Today it's cool outside with the rain and it's very cold in here. So we can never be happy. We never get everything we want. Um, just to touch base before I jump into the message that PD and Yoli did an amazing job explaining about the fast coming up. I just want to share on that a little more because that's something that hits home with me only because I've seen over the years, I felt I was misguided when I first started doing prayer and fasting, prayer and fasting. We understand what it is. I want to encourage everybody. Think about what you're going to do for a fast. Why? Because the fast is only the tool to get you to pray. I think a lot of times we focus too much on the fasting. And I've seen it historically. During a fast, we all come up to each other. Bro, how you doing on the fast? How you doing on the fast? It's never, hey, how's your prayer time going? Has God spoken to you? It's all about, oh, look at all I'm sacrificing. I only eat the dew of a leaf every morning. I eat nothing that casts a shadow. Good for you. Who cares? Are you praying to God? So I like the fact that they share that. I encourage you guys, pick whatever fast God is leading you towards, but it's not about the fast. The fast is merely what's going to drive you to seek God because ultimately we need to hear from God. We are in an amazing stage of our church. We're one year in. We're growing. We're getting stronger. I want us to continue that so that we can reach more people with the word and the love of God. Amen? Amen. So today we'll jump in. Let's dive into our message we are continuing with our Fruits of the Spirit series as we're going through this little portion of Scripture in Galatians chapter 5. So as we've been doing every single week, we're going to read Galatians 5, 22 through 26. These are the base verses for our teachings, as well as go over the fruits that are listed there by the Apostle Paul. And here's how they read. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So just to put them up on the screen like we've done, we're just going to list the nine fruits that Paul has listed here in Scripture. And once again, they are love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, I want to take one moment just to do a little side note, only because I think a lot of times, even us as Christians, as we start to study our word and get a little deeper into it, we mix up or we think they work together, the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Now, they're two totally different things. When you read about the fruit of the Spirit, I know we're, we're going through each of the nine, but it's listed as a singular item. The fruit of the Spirit is, not the fruits of the Spirit are. And you can go through all the different versions of the Bible. It's a singular thing. Why? Because these are things that should naturally grow in us as the Spirit in our life grows and we get closer to God. These all are things that we should cultivate as Christians with the Spirit living inside of us. It's not like the gifts. The gifts are different. The gifts as why they're called gifts. Gifts are given without regard for the person by the Holy Spirit. We don't know why the Holy Spirit chooses to give one person the ability to speak in tongues, the other person the ability to teach or preach the word, the other person the gift of hospitality, discernment, wisdom. Those are gifts given. 
the fruit of the Spirit are things we should all be cultivating. You don't pick one out of these. It's not like we go, I'm feeling goodness today, all the rest are out. These are things that should naturally come from our lives as the Spirit grows within us. So I wanted to kind of make sure we keep that in mind as we're going through these different fruit. Now, this week we're actually going to be covering three. I'm going to cover kindness, goodness, and gentleness. Kindness, goodness, and gentleness. Now, I'm going to kind of dive in. I'm going to be honest. And I share this with Yoli. So far out of the messages and the, you know, I always like to do research when I do my messages and not just get up here and talk and everything. This was actually the one I had to do the most research for. Why? Because I'm not going to lie. These three words all kind of sound like the same thing. They all kind of lump together in my understanding as we use them in the English language. So I'm like, why specifically put those three different things if they seem to describe the same action or the same person that we should be? So I've titled today's message, Fruits That Are Made For Sharing. Fruits That Are Made For Sharing. Why? Because all these things should be the natural fruit that the Spirit is growing in us that portrays Christ in our life to the world outside. But these specific ones have to do a lot with our interactions with others. In other words, joy and peace. You can see joy and peace, but joy and peace is something within me. The love within me, you see it now gentleness, kindness, and goodness. These are things that we're sharing with the outside world. These are demeanors. These are positions of ourself that we'll kind of find out. So how is it that they sound so familiar? Do they mean different things? That, that, I, I thought that was a good question for myself. I always go into these things. Why did God choose to share the words and the messages that he did? It's not that we're not taking it at face value, but there's understanding to it. Otherwise, we're not sure about what it is he's trying to tell us. So, and we can use these words interchangeably, like I said. Like, like in other words, man, that person, that, that person over there, they're so kind and gentle. Or, or that, that, that person over there, they do such good things. They're such a good person. We use them to describe our understanding of the world and the people and how they are. But is that necessarily exactly what God's trying to portray to us and deliver to us in these verses here? You know, like I've said with some of the other words, it's kind of our understanding versus the definition of what they really are and what they're portraying. An example I, I, I thought of last night was, if anybody's ever seen the movie The Princess Bride, that's a well-known movie. And at one point, one of the characters, Enigo Montoya, you killed my father, prepare to die. I love that guy. He's sitting there talking with the one bad guy, Vizzini. And the Vizzini is the, the smart guy, the brain in the movie. He's always coming up with these different schemes. And Vizzini is sitting there, and he keeps saying, every time that the hero, the, the hero does something that he can't believe, inconceivable. Inconceivable. Everything he says, inconceivable. Finally, Inigo looks at him and says, I do not think that word means what you think it means. Why? Because they both had a different understanding of what that word was. And I thought that's a good portrayal. Here's where we read the word. If I just take my understanding of the word kindness, goodness, and gentleness, and you take your understanding, you take your understanding, there's a pretty good idea that we're going to have three different approaches to what God's trying to tell us in this message and in these words. So we're going to go through, we're going to break them down as usual. We're going to get a little bit of a Greek lesson. Today's even more because we're covering three of them. And like I said, it took a little more research to find out what was going on here with words that sound so similar. So the first point I want to share is, oh, you're too kind. Oh, oh you're too kind. I, I know that we use that as a thing when somebody, oh, 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 you're too kind. Like when somebody wants to offer us something, like, oh, hey, let, let, me, let me buy you a sandwich. Oh, you're too kind. Inside, we're going, heck yeah, buy me a sandwich. I'm hungry right now. On the outside, though, we got to be nice. And, oh, you're too kind. It's like, just buy me the sandwich. Sure, why not? So what is the word for kindness that is used in the Greek scripture? So, bless you. Get it out of you. Get it out of you. It is actually a word, krestotes, C -H -R -E -S -T -S. T-O-T-E-S. Not tostones. Crestotes. Crestotes. So the crestotes, that's the word for kindness. Now, it's funny. Here's where it actually came from. And once again, this is why I had to do a little bit of research. It, going down that wormhole. It comes from the word crestos. Now, originally in Greek, crestos was not meant to be a disposition of our demeanor. It was actually meant in the word as kind as into its purpose what it was made for, that kind of item. Like in other words, you would say, that food, that, that, that food there, that's cresto for your health. That's the kind that is good for your health. Or that kind of offering 
is the right kind of offering for God. It meant to be something that was the right item for its intended purpose. But it's morphed over the years in Greek to where it more so meant a kindness. But what kind of kindness? What, what, what does it mean when we say kindness? Well, the one way it was put good was to give it a broader definition is describing someone with other qualities of greatness, goodness of heart to show kindness. The kindness that who would show? God would show. That Jesus would show. What would his kindness be? What kind of kindness would he show? Well, in Romans eleven twenty two, 22, Paul wrote, Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. I was curious when I read that, but kindness to you provided that you continue in his kindness. Well, isn't kindness an action outward from me to somebody else? How can I continue in his kindness? Well, it is the kind of love that he's putting out, the kindness that he's pouring out to us, that Christotes. He's pouring out this kindness to us that reveals his nature towards us, his forgiveness, his understanding, his love. That is the kind of his kindness as it pours out to us. Also in Romans, a little bit earlier on, chapter 2, Paul wrote this to some of them, having to do with judgment of others. It says, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgments against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches and the what? Of his kindness, his forbearance and patience, which we covered the other week, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. Now, side note as we read those verses, I always tell people this. We, we especially in, 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 in the Christian world have this idea that we got to be so overly nice to everybody. And they, I can't judge you. Please do not mistake judging somebody with correcting somebody. There, there's a big difference. In other words, you can be corrected. You can be convicted by somebody. In other words, I'm not going to sit here and watch a fellow brother or sister in Christ do things that I know are going to hurt their body, their spirit, their soul without correcting them. I'm not judging you. I'm not damning you to hell or whatever. That's, that's judgment. I'm not judging. We are correcting and redirecting. That's where I want to make sure that people don't misunderstand the two things. But the important thing to understand out of these verses as it deals with the kindness today is Paul wrote, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness? Not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. God's kindness has everything to do with being like him for the eternal path. In other words, getting to heaven. Are we showing that kindness that's going to make you sit there and say, oh, you can treat me so differently than everybody else. Why? Because I want to share with you the same kindness that God poured out to me. Because everything about God's kindness has to do with me repenting so that I can give my life to him and go to heaven one day. We want to share that same kindness with everybody else. We want to be just like God and how we display to other people. Yeah, but, but Rich, here's the thing. I don't want to show kindness to a lot of people. There's a lot of people I don't want to show kindness to. I mean, I know the one scripture says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I prefer the other translation, do unto others as they have done unto me. I, I, absolutely. Payback's always good. I don't want to show kindness to those people, Rich. Well, I hate to burst your bubble with the next verse, but it's Luke 6.35. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Mm. That's for all the guys who don't want to lend their tools out to that neighbor. They won't give them back. That's not what God's saying. Don't lend your tools. Keep them. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is what? Kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Don't misinterpret that. It's not saying if somebody wants to come punch you in the face, you sit there and go, okay, I'll be kind to you. Go ahead. No, it's not, it's not what the word's saying. It's saying that just as we at one point were enemies of God, because until we give our life to God, we are enemies of God. We do not love the things he loves. We do not do the things he does. So therefore, he showed love for us. And we even read in the scripture that 
Jesus died for us while we were still yet sinners. He showed kindness to us when we were his enemy. That's the same kindness he's talking about. He's talking about people that are against you, people that are not of God. Are we still going to show him that same kindness that he afforded to us? That's where we need to be. Now, it's important to note, especially as we're going through these different words, because like I said, doing the research, I was kind of like, man, they all sound the same. Kindness, as it, it is used in Crestotes, is a passive type of word. In other words, it's more of a demeanor. It's a passive kindness that I'm just going to show to you by not getting angry at you or by loving on you. It's, it's more of a passive type disposition. That's important to understand. It's not just acts of kindness. It's the disposition and the person that I am. How's my demeanor with other people? Is that of kindness? Now, the second point I'm going to look at today is as gentle as doves. Sounds so nice. As gentle as doves. Now, Jesus used the dove to describe that type of gentleness in Matthew chapter 10, right before he sends out the disciples to go preach the word, starting first with the nation of Israel, the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus told them, as you go out and preach the word, I want you to be as wise as serpents, but as gentle as doves. I want you to be as gentle as doves. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I've always viewed the dove as a dumb bird, and maybe it's just because they're so passive and maybe they're gentle. I don't know. They're not my favorite bird and everything, but they've always been used with this kind of gentleness about them. You know, flying with the olive branch. It means peace. It means love. We're going to care for each other. I just see them as the birds that like to make a mess on my car right after I leave the car wash. But here it is used to describe something that is gentle. That is the picture that Jesus is showing them there. Well, what is the Greek word here used for gentleness? It's prautes. P-R-A-U-T-E-S. Prautes. Or if you're using it to describe someone who's just gentle, it's praus, without the T-E-S at the end. Here, it is meant for someone who has a genuine consideration for others. It's someone who is really, if you're being praus, the prautis, if you're showing that, that gentleness, I genuinely have a concern for other people and their well-being. Their, their position, where they are, what help do they need. I want to show a gentleness to them. It is more of a consideration for others. What's a good example here? Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Jesus tells us, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now in verse 29, the word gentle there is praus, P-R-A-U-S. It's that same type of gentleness. Jesus is saying, I am gentle. What's the point of those verses? That the Lord understands that we're running around going crazy. we got things going on. We're overwhelmed. We're struggling. Hey, hey, hey. I'll give you rest and I'll give you peace. He's genuinely concerned for our well-being and our position. He doesn't want us going around at 900 miles an hour with our hair on fire all the time. That's not what the Lord wants. The Lord wants us to be diligent, but he wants us to find peace in him. His work is not meant to be a burden. His work is meant to be freeing, new life, new creation. And we are then called to go share that with others. So his yoke is easy. His burden is light. We, typically, like we do with everything, we turn everything into a burden. We make everything overwhelming. So we don't feel gentle about it because we're going, we're going, we're going. But God is saying, I, you know, I want to be gentle here. I'm really worried about your well-being. I want you to be healthy. I want you guys to have a good place. So this word, this prautes, this gentleness, it's us genuinely being concerned for somebody else. I like this way that it was, it was phrased by one uh, author. Gentle friendliness, meekness, it's a strength that accommodates to another's weakness. There's nothing that makes me feel better, and I hope it's the same way with you guys, that if somebody else is in need, we can provide what we have in our strength with God to them to help them. You see, if somebody's in sin... Can we help them in their weakness? Because that's what sin is. It's our human weakness where we cannot deny things. Can we be a strength for somebody else? It's, it's almost this humble position that I don't think myself too important, that I don't overthink how important I am. Because even Jesus said in those verses up there, not only is he gentle, but he's humble in heart. That the creator of the universe came down and worked with his hands he sweated, he got dirty, he got nasty. He was humble. He didn't walk around saying, hey, 
I'm, I'm kind of a big deal in case you didn't know. He walked around with an authority, and that's where we mistake meekness for weakness. You can be meek. Meek is nothing more than power under control, strength under control. You can see that person sometimes. You're like, man, they're not saying it. They're not flaunting it. But you know that person's got a power and a strength inside of them. They don't have to tell you they're the boss. You just kind of know because that's how Jesus was. And that's the same thing he's saying here. He's humble. He's strong. But he is genuinely worried about our position. He wants to pour out that gentleness upon us. We as Christians, especially those that are in a good position and are walking, we're strong. That's the same prautes, same gentleness we need to have for everybody else. When God is filling me, God is strengthening me, am I genuinely concerned about somebody else? Or am I more of the mentality, I've got mine, you get yours, and we'll all be fine. That's not how the work of God goes. In fact, in James chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, James, the brother of Jesus, writes, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and quick to become, uh, slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and do what? Humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Yeah, I sent out a little message like an encouragement to the, the church team yesterday, and I just put in there one thing. Hey, we're called to be de disciples of Christ. Let's own it. Own it. In other words, I can't tell somebody that I've been born again, I have the power of Jesus living in me, but I show nothing of the fruit of the Spirit growing inside. Own it. Not in an arrogant way. You can still be humble about it, but be confident of it that I am a new creation. I can show these fruit of the Spirit because it is Him that has changed me and strengthened me. I don't, if we walk around and say, yeah, 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 I'm such a new person now because, you know, I met that whole God guy. I gave him some suggestions. He took them. Now I'm a better person. No, it's simply the other way around. I ran into God like a freight train. He blew me apart and he put me back together the right way. It's only because of him that I can do what I do now. See, here's, here's where a misunderstanding if we only read with, I hate to say it, our English eyes because it was written in a different language. To give you an idea of this prautes, what the word really meant in Greek as it was written. Aristotle. Most of us have heard of Aristotle, famous Greek philosopher, 300-something B.C. I think he had a handle on the Greek language, slightly. He described this prautes as a man who has so much control that he is angry at the right time, always ready to be angry at the right time, but never angry at the wrong time. But why would you even describe gentleness as angry? Because don't... To, don't, don't mistake gentleness for permissiveness in the kingdom of God. We go back to that whole judgment thing. We sometimes want to say, oh, but I, I don't want to make somebody feel bad. Better to feel bad and create a little trouble in the relationship than a few years down the road when we're up in heaven and they're not. I'd rather you be a little uncomfortable now than really uncomfortable then. We, we have this thing that we hate confrontation so much, we would rather let somebody go right into a fire without ever warning them. That, that's, that's not gentleness. That, that's, not, that's not a genuine concern for somebody else's well-being. That's why, don't mistake what it's meant to say. It's meant to say, genuinely concerned that I love you, I care for you, and in your weakness, I want to show strength. It's the same thing here. We can't be permissive and just let somebody go. If somebody really loves me, they'll stop me from messing myself up. If somebody really cares for me, they'll stop me before I make that mistake. Because... Being a friend to somebody doesn't mean you always do what they like. You do what they need. And that's what we're called to do as Christians. We have to understand that gentleness, this type of gentleness, we have to know when to react at the right time. In fact, in Galatians 6, right after these verses on the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 6, 1 through 2, Paul writes, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. It is active. You need to be gentle with people, not rubbing them on the belly and telling them everything they're doing is just fine. Gently guiding them to where they need to go. Gently correcting them from their mistakes. Gently redirecting them in the path they're supposed to be on. That's the gentleness of God that we're reading about that is part of the fruit of the Spirit. 
We have to protect one another. Well, the third one I want to look at is goodness. And the point is, how good can we get? How good can we get? Now, the Greek word, and I'm going to look as I'm spelling this out so I don't misspell it. It's agathosune, A-G-A-T-H-O-S-Y-N-E, A-G-A-T-H-O-S-Y-N-E, agathosune. Don't worry, I made sure to push a little button that tells me how to pronounce these words because otherwise I mess them up completely. Agatha sign, that don't make no sense. So, here we go again with this whole kindness, gentleness, goodness. In the English language, they all sound the same. So why the different descriptors? This one I loved. This one, the looking up and researching this word, agathosune. Because although it sounds very similar to the others, because even if you look up in Greek, the, the, the very first word, the krestotes, if you look it up, its descriptor is kind, good, kindness, goodness, in the passive sense. But what's amazing is this is an active word. This is not a passive word. So that's why there's a different descriptor for it, because the meaning of the word is totally different. So even though they seem to overlap, it's very different. One author wrote, and I love this one, it's described as aggressive goodness. Aggressive goodness. Hang on a sec. That makes absolutely zero sense, right? Aggressive goodness? How can the two go together? I don't know. Well, here's one example. If you're a sports fan, any kind of sport, I don't care. I love football. I grew up watching football, but then I got a love for soccer when my daughter played soccer. There was always this one thing that she's out there, and she would be aggressive, but sometimes my, my daughter was funny. She's fast in pickup speed off the line. She's not as quick as some others. So there were this one tournament, this young lady from, I think they were from Canada, one of the teams we were playing. She kept getting around our daughter. And I kept telling my daughter and her coach same way, stop stepping back, be aggressive, go at her. Not in a mean way, you don't go and punch her in the back of the head or anything, but go at her. Don't wait for her to come to you because you're on your heels. So the pastor and the dad were having an internal struggle during this one point in the game. My daughter decides she's going to be aggressive about it, decides to start hitting the girl off. My daughter was a sweeper. So the girl's coming around the corner, heading towards the goal. My daughter reacts, puts her foot on that ball, lowers that shoulder. That girl literally went flying off the field. Off, I mean, she went off her feet. And, uh, hits and jumps up immediately and puts her hand up to the coach. The inside dad was going, try that again. You ain't going to do it again. The pastor in me was like, I put a seat. That poor little thing, she probably hurt. It was an internal battle. I'm not going to lie. But it was aggressive goodness. In other words, she was being aggressive about being good at her job. And what was she was supposed to do? That's what it means with this word, this agathosune. It's an aggressive goodness. Biblical example I give you for aggressive goodness. Jesus showed an agathosune. He showed an aggressive goodness. When he went into the temple and saw that these people were turning his father's house into a den of thieves, into a mockery, and he cleared that place by whipping them. That is an aggressive goodness. Our father in heaven was being, dis, it was being slammed. He was being disrespected. The house of God turned into a parlor. And Jesus said, this ain't happening. But we know that everything that Jesus did was good. He didn't sin. So therefore, he wasn't sinning when he did that. That was an agathosune. It was an aggressive goodness. It was an action done. Vice versa. What's a krestotes? What was that passive kindness and love he showed? The woman who was, caught, who was sinful wept on his feet so much and then dried him with her hair. He just loved on that and gently was there. It was a passiveness, just being in his presence. So even our Lord can show examples of the two different types, and that's how we need to be. That goodness needs to be an aggressive. That doesn't mean to go out and attack people. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying we need to be proactive in our word. We need to be proactive as a church. We need to be proactive as disciples of Christ. We can't fall back on our heels and expect everything to come at us because then we're going to be off guard. We have to have show an aggressive goodness. Go out there and get people. Go out there and stop somebody before they get into trouble. Romans 3, verses 10 through 12. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now, Paul wrote that to the Romans who were not Christians at the time. 
that they were all over the place. They were worshiping all kinds of God. They even had an altar that said to the unknown God, just in case we missed one, we want to cover all of our bases. Paul was telling him, you have zero understanding. You're not good. Now, uh, here's where I, I, I go back and forth with the struggle of goodness in the world and goodness in the kingdom of God. We can look and say by human standards, people do good things. I'll, I'll give you one. Habitat for Humanity. Groups of people that get together on the weekends or whatever days they can and build houses for needy people. I mean, build them. I mean, you know, depending on the crew, your house might be a little crooked. No, but it's a house. It's up. But they're doing good things. So why would that be described as something different than the goodness of God? Because ultimately, if the driving force behind my goodness is for self-motivation, self-preservation, my feeling of goodness compared to the goodness of heaven, the goodness of eternity, the goodness of salvation. There's the difference. Now, we should naturally, the worst thing is when you see people that have, are agnostic or even atheist that do good things, and then Christians who are supposed to have been saved by God and were changed don't want to do a darn thing for anybody else. That's a different thing we'll have a discussion on another day. But that's where people in the world have trouble with, oh, God's good. Then why aren't most of the people who claim to be people of God do good? What is the difference? It is an aggressive goodness. We need to go out. We don't understand. We're not good because of the things we do. We're good because of the one we love. And that's where the difference comes in. The goodness is something that comes from God. It's not through our own understanding. I'll finish off with these verses. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Paul writes here, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Crave spiritual milk like newborn babies. and it Sounds a little weird, but here's the thing. Once again, we go from a world descriptor to a kingdom descriptor and understanding. So I don't care if you're 10... 50, 80, what? when you give your life to Christ, you are a newborn baby spiritually. Yes, you may have a lot of life experience, but you're new into the word of God and the life of God. So as babies, you know, you, as much as we think they want to, you don't give a newborn baby a churrasco, a nice ribeye steak. Maybe you can put it in the blender, make some potaje, and you can give it like that. But you can't just give it to them. No, Petey, you can't do that with the grandkids. But... You can't give them that. You've got to give them spiritual milk. Well, it's much the same with us when we start our walk. If we try and explain everything in the Bible and you try and eat every word and understand everything, you're going to overwhelm yourself. Your system can't handle it. Just like a newborn baby, you've got to start off with milk. Understand the basics. Once we get the concept that when I read this word, I'm not reading this word to make myself feel good. I'm reading this word to find out what God's telling me. Out of that, I will have the byproduct of feeling good because I'm doing my father's business. I'm doing what he wills in my life. But we're not ready for that at the beginning. We're not ready for that the first time we step into church. I, I, I'm not ready for that. I just, I want to hear good things to make me feel good and go out and do good things. No. When we read the word, it's to understand what is God trying to tell us? What do you want me to do with my life, Lord? How can I serve you? What can I do? How can I show this kindness, gentleness, and goodness that you describe and prescribe to me? for the rest of the world around me. That is where these understandings, as we go through these fruits, like I said at the beginning, understand, we don't pick and choose. These are just examples even, because I would go as far as to say, even when we do our research, there are other things that show the fruit of the Spirit in our life. These are examples that he gave and shared so that we have an understanding of what it means. Learn what he's actually saying. We need to be kind, like Christ. We need to be gentle as a dove, that caring for others and the concern. But we need to show that goodness of God, which is an aggressive goodness to go out, be proactive, and help out our fellow Christians, our brothers and sisters, and especially to share the word of God with the lost. Because if you're just wandering around lost, you'll never get to the destination of heaven. And the party will be one less person possibly than it could have been if we didn't do our part. We need to be aggressively good with sharing the word of God. So let these fruit grow in our life, and even more so, let them be apparent and share them with everybody else around us. So let's pray. 
Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you as we can come here freely and worship you, God. That may we never take that for granted. First off, the act of you saving us, the act that we have new life through you, Lord, that we have been saved. We are redeemed. And it is only through your sacrifice, Jesus. But then on top of that, now we have access to you, God. We can come worship you freely. And we're so thankful for that. Lord, I pray for anybody here today or maybe watching online that has never heard the gospel presented to them, maybe does not have a relationship with you, never understood that you are a personal God who wants to be our Father, not just our Creator. And in the beauty of the gospel is it's so simple for us that you, Jesus Christ, came down to earth, lived as one of us, yet did it without sin. Perfect. Lord, you endured what we went through. You understand us. And then furthermore, you died on a cross for us to take our sins and then resurrected three days later, you overcame sin and death. And now we can have access to the Father through you. That if we just receive you, we acknowledge that we are sinners, that we need you, Lord, because we are separated from God because of our sin. But oh, through you, Jesus Christ, we have new life. We can become new creations. So God, I pray for anybody that does not have the relationship that may they make that decision today. I pray, Lord, that you continue to go before us. Lord, I pray as we're going through this series, we have an understanding that this fruit within us, Holy Spirit of you in our life, it grows, it flourishes like an orchard just full of beautiful fruit. Can we look like that to the rest of the world? Can we be like that to the rest of the world? Can you grow in our lives to be shared with everybody around us? So God, I pray for that for each and every one of us, that we dive in deeper, we understand more, and we get closer to you. God, I pray for each one of us, go before us, Lord, strengthen us. I pray for all the teachers and students that started back at school this year. Lord, be upon them, protect them, that the children receive what they need, and that the teachers be strengthened with what they need, Lord, that they are leaders to the next generation. And I pray that they own that and they know that. So go with them and strengthen them. For the rest of us, God, I pray you strengthen us throughout the week. Use us wherever we are. Maybe we be lights in a dark world to show the love and the grace that you bestowed upon us. So Lord, we come before you. Lord, we're so thankful. We love you. And we thank you for all that you do. In your precious name we pray. And everybody says, amen, amen. So for anybody who made that decision, either here or online, DM us. Will that be the right thing? No, not even DM. I don't know. Message us. I don't know. I'm not techie. I'm like Petey, book face and all that stuff. We'd love to get a Bible in your hands. If not, we got our team over there ready to rock and roll. If you don't have a Bible or you know somebody who needs one, please grab one on your way out. They are free of charge. For the rest of us, please don't run out the door. We have stuff in the back. We have games. We have snacks. We have so many activities to do. But thank you guys for coming. Please be safe out there. And happy Sunday, everybody.